Hello. All right, let me bring this up. Hello. So today we are going to now use uh, read it from the laser scanner. This will be the same thing that should be provided on any real robot. Most robots have some sort of laser scanner. Um, some modern day sensors will also give you a point cloud. It's a little bit advanced for this class, but usually you'll see a laser scanner. So first things first, what is the laser scan? Let's bring this up real quick. Again, it's going to be a sensor message. So if we use ROS2 interface show, slash, add in sensor, sensor messages, slash message, slash laser, laser scan, capital S for some reason. This is what the laser message entails. And this is significantly more complex than what we used anywhere before. And so first of all, the first thing we have is a variable called header, which has these sub elements inside it. At the moment, this will not be important. If we were doing mapping or wanted to use rviz2, we would have to care about the frame ID. At the moment, we don't need to worry about it. But just know that it does have a header. Also, in case you're wondering, the header has changed. So it, we are not, we no longer have sequence. There used to be a sequence number for this, but there is no longer a sequence number. Uh, down here we have angle min representing the minimum of the angle and the angle max representing the max and the angle increment. So it means for every scan, scan how, what was the change in the angle? And these three values are in very, very important in order to interpret the ranges. We have a time increment, which uh, this will be this may or may not be populated by some sensors. Uh, you may have to do this manually. And this is also important because because if your your laser scan may not be synchronous and we'll talk about this at the end of the, the video but this may not be populated so you will you probably will have to um, do this manually we also have range min range max most laser scanners have a very very small range min so this is not usually super important uh, the range max is important and we'll talk about why and finally, we have a float 32 array of ranges. So basically, this is a float array of range of called ranges. And we have a discrete number of values. Now, when you think about this for a moment, let me bring up a new terminal real quick. If I have a float array of ranges. I'm going to use pseudocode here for a minute. This is quite literally what you're, I mean, except of course there's going to be a lot more of them. But this is quite literally what you will get from your ranges. This doesn't really tell you without the context of the other stuff in the sensor message. This doesn't tell you what is being measured where. So let me see if I can. So here, if I look back here, I have angle min. And that's going to be my first measurement in my range. That makes sense. I also have my angle increment. So my angle increment is going to be my angle min, or so I should say my second rank value is going to be my angle min plus one angle increment. And that will be over here. It's also worth noting that the angle min and angle max are in radians. So don't forget radians, not degrees.
and the angle min is going to be negative. Now I think I got this backwards in my previous video and I apologize, but if you think about a unit circle, in standard unit zero, uh, zero degrees is facing right in the standard unit circle. If I am going positive, I'm going counterclockwise, which would be left. I think I had it backwards in one of the other videos. If I'm going negative, I would be going right. <clears throat> so generally speaking, we go from the right side to the left. And right will be less than zero, and positive will be greater than zero. So most laser sensors are going to be symmetric. So it'll be something from, like, say, negative uh, 90, but in radians, to 90, or negative 180 to 180, again, in radians. Um, that's generally how laser sensors are going to work. So we want to keep that in the back of our mind when we walk through this. Now, one thing we're going to want to do is we're going to want to create two functions because I, in order to read the ranges, the actual values I'm getting from the laser scan, I'm going to need to convert to an index. So say I have an angle. I want to know what the angle is at negative 10 degrees in radians. Well, I need to you know, convert that first to radians, then to an index in order to read the ranges. Again, using pseudocode here. So this is one thing we're up to. And also, you'll probably end up having the reverse scenario where you have an index and you want to find out what angle that's at. So you also have to go backwards. So that is the, <clears throat> that is the overall, you know, just, just talking quickly about laser scanner. Again, we'll walk, I'll walk through the code, but you want to familiarize yourself with this and everything inside laser scan is fair fair game for a midterm uh, intensities are the quality of the signal we probably won't be using intensities but again everything inside this laser scanner message is fair games so for either midterm or final all right so now let's open up our script and as you can see, this one's much, much more complex. Again, feel free to pause and copy or type, type down the script or, or type out the script. But uh, we're going to do this in a little, little bit different chunks. So the idea here is we're going to read in the laser scan and we're going to find a safe way, a safe direction to move so we don't run into any walls. So here are imports. We're going to need a few more imports. We're going to import, um, actually, I don't think we're actually going to use random. Yeah, I don't think we're actually using random anymore. So we don't, we don't actually need random, but we need RCLPy and we need math. We also need from geometry message dot message, we're going to import twist. This is going to be the command we send to the motor. And new on the block is sensor messages dot message import laser scan so it's a laser scan we just talked about now there are several ways I could do this and I'm going to do it a specific way and I'll explain why in a moment again our main is going to look pretty simple it's similar to our simple drive we have main we initialize a simple laser drive class which is this class here we have rclpy.spin mover and destroy the node and then shut down. Now, before you get copying the code, let's talk about what's happening here. I'm now going to have a callback. I'm going to have a callback that's going to be reading a laser scan. We're going to do some stuff. And then I'm also going to have a timer that's going to call move 
And assuming I have my laser data read, I'm gonna go do some stuff here. And this is what's actually gonna publish to my motors. I could, for this example, if I wanted to, I could take this code and have it driven by the callback. So copy and paste it up here after this and get rid of this function altogether. I could. However, this would only work if I'm driving the robot based on one sensor, in this case, laser callback. In this case where I want to say I have multiple sensors eventually, say a blob tracker, um, a laser, or um, you know, blob tracker, computer vision, some other different sets of sensors, sonar, I will want a separate function altogether. Traditionally, I use threads for this, but with the timer mechanism, we don't have to lock out shared data. So this is actually simpler to use a timer. So that's the architecture. I'm going to have a, a function that's basically going to get pulled every tenth of a or called every tenth of a second. And I'm going to have a function that is going to re, uh, get called every time there's new laser data. And we're going to um, go through and sterilize the laser data, as we'll talk about in a moment. All right, so let's look at the, uh, the constructor. The constructor itself is not super complex. We are going to have, we initialize our node, simple laser driver. We are going to have a publisher. This should be becoming old hat. Self.create publisher, twist, command velocity, 10. Uh, again, I'm not going to worry about what type, who, which command velocity I'm calling at the moment because we're going to be using a namespace in our launch file. I'm also going to use self.pub and have a, or sub, excuse me, and create a subscription to laser scan called scan. Again, not worrying about which scan because we're going to be using namespace. And invoke self.laser callback, this function, with a queue size of 10. I'm going to simply keep these uh, as available data. I technically only have to populate these data once, but I'm going to just go ahead and populate every time. If you want to optimize this where you only populate this once, go for it. Um, it it's not going to cost you. The extra few CPU cycles aren't going to cost you much though. So this is laser data. This is actually going to be the ranges array from that message we talked about. Minimum angle is going to be angle min. From max angle is going to be angle max. Delta angle is going to be uh, angle increment. Max range is going to be max range. And this is going to be read in from the laser data. Very, very important. Under no circumstances should you hard code the, these values. Every laser scanner is different. Some I've seen some as small as 30 degrees, I, and I've seen some that have like 360 degree scans. So the, this is not, under any circumstance, we should not hard code these values. Or sorry, 360 I meant from negative 180 to 180. Um, so you want to take these values from the laser scan itself and make your code generic so it can run on any laser scanner, not simply, um, not simply a specific type. Now for this, we will assume that we have at least 45, um, yeah, let's say at least 45 degrees either way. I can't think of any laser scanner. That, so again, we can make, like here I make an assumption that we have at least 10 degrees and that's okay. But, uh, we are going to, we don't, we want to be cautious though, because we may only have from plus and minus 45. So again, do not hard code these values. And when, after these values, I set up my timer. Again, we're going to call self.move at 0.1. That'll give us 10 hertz. Now, there is a minor problem here.
in the circumstance when you're running this alone you will probably get 10 hertz so running on your own computer while you write your scripts you will get 10 hertz or something very very close like 9.98 hertz when you run on the network, you will get much less. And by much less, I mean, uh, let's see, seven hertz probably. That's what we were getting last fall. So around seven hertz. Uh, we can do some experiments in class and actually look at the hertz of the topic. So if I go to my command, if I go to my command prompt here and I do ROS to topic, and look at my options, I actually can run Hertz and find out what the update is for my given, my given topic. Now why this is problematic is if when you tweak, which we'll talk about, when you tweak these values for controlling your robot, if you assume you're going to have 10 hertz, you're going to be in trouble. So these values I'm using here, I've hard-coded some, some scalars we'll talk about in a minute, but you want to actually probably have some sort of mechanism to detect what the actual hertz is. And whatever the actual hertz is over the 10 hertz, you want to scale your speeds by that. So essentially, the slower you get the laser update, the slower your robot goes, at least going forward, maybe not necessarily turning. You could think of it as kind of a proportional controller. The slower your feedback sequence is, the slower you're going to have to make your controller system react. Or I'm sorry, the slower your max speed and max gain is going to be for your controller. I don't know if that helps you or not, but if you do know feedback control systems, that is essentially what we're going to do here. All right, we'll come back to this problem in a minute, but keep this in the back of your mind. So I am not going to do this part for you. So this will be probably part of the lab. You're, you're going to need to import time and keep track of when you got your laser scanner. Again, you cannot necessarily guarantee that you are going to get this um, and if you do get this, it's not necessarily going to be right. A lot of time the hardware will just well, a lot of times the hardware and simulators will just give you a set value. So uh, usually hardware itself will actually give you a, a, an attempted value. But again, if you're running this over a network, you could have an un unexpected latency and you will. All right, so here we are going to have laser callback gets called when we get our laser message. So first thing I do is I set all my values. Again, you probably only have to do this once, but I'm just going to set them anyway. Now, if you look at our laser code, where did I get these values from? This is, for, if we look at our topic, excuse me, you can see that this is where data is our object for our laser scan. So angle min, I got it from here. Angle max, I got it from here. Angle increment and range max, I got it from here. So that's how I found out what these values were. I'm saving it to my own variables, self.min angle, self.max angle, self.delta angle, self.max range, self.laser data. And then laser data is going to equal data dot ranges, which will be the actual distances in a float array. Now, some sensors will give you math infinite if it goes beyond the max range. I've always thought that was odd because, it, yes, I understand if it goes beyond the max range of the scanner, you can't tell. But calling it infinite is not useful, so in my opinion. So what I would recommend is I've gone through each element and I have to use the index for this. So for I in range of zero to self.laser data, 
length of self.laser data. Then I'm going to say if math dot is in inf, which means is infinite, we're going to set say the self uh, if self dot laser data i is infinite, then we're going to set self dot laser data i to self dot max range. This for our purposes will be more useful. I'm sure there is situations where having you know having a statement usually use the statement is infinite so you know that it's not actually the max range it's actually beyond the max range but for our, our purposes this will be more useful again please pause the video if you need to so this will be called back from our subscriber and all it does is going to populate these values including our um, our laser data now normally in the past when I've done this with threads this would be its own separate thread and all of this would be shared data so I would have to lock and unlock here and lock whenever I needed to use the data and unlock when I was done since it appears, and I haven't had any problems yet, that by doing rclpy.spin in ROS2, this is what will update your callbacks and update your timer. As I learned when I was making these videos, if you do not have spin, the timer will not activate and call this function. So that makes me suspect that these two functions will never actually be capable of interrupting each other because I'm guessing that this spin function is going to update them in serial, um, in series. If I find out that's wrong, we'll have to put lock mechanisms here. But so far, I've not had to use a lock mechanism, and I've had this code running for a pretty long time. So this is going to function kind of, we can kind of think of this as a thread. Again, if it was a thread, this would be a while, while RCLPy is okay, and we'd have a sleep. But this is just gonna be a function that gets called every 10 hertz. So the first thing we do is make sure we actually got laser data. Initially, if we haven't got laser data, um, we're just not gonna run it. Once we get laser data, we're going to run this with the last data we got, which keep in mind may not have been updated. Again, you're gonna have latency over the network, so it, it might be possible that you did not get a new laser data. So you might send a command message, maybe two messages from the same laser data, and that's okay, that's okay. So first we're gonna say, how fast do we wanna go forward? Now, there are a couple ways you could do this. I'm going to show you a, a kind of naive three arc system for a safe wander. In class, I will probably have talked about the vector sum method you can also use. Um, this, this will give you a safe wander as I will show you, except for the fact that I don't have, I'm not taking into account latency, so my speeds might be a little fast here. Um, this is also assuming that the robot driver is going to use a 0 to 1 value for its uh, translational speed, so the linear speed, assuming 0 to 100% throttle. Not all robot drivers are like that. Again, so this, this might have to be scaled. You may have to have some sort of, for different robots, you may have to have times the scalar value here as you'll see. But that's part of the experimentation of doing different robotic platforms. So what I originally did is I took a range between negative 10 degrees times math pi dot 180. Once again, oh, I'm sorry, I'm getting ahead of myself. Before we go, before we go through any of this, come back, we'll come back to that in a minute. Here are my two angle to index and index to angle. These are two helper functions that I think you will find very useful. And I should have gone over this in class, or will. So here, if I have an angle, say, I don't know, 10 degrees, but again, it's gonna be in radians, 
what is the corresponding or closest corresponding index in my range array. And the way you're going to find this is you're going to take the angle, subtract self.min angle. Now remember, self.min angle is, most, is almost always negative. It still works if it's not, but it's going to, you, I can promise you it's going to most likely be negative. So this is going to give you a value, subtract a negative value. So let's say, let's use degrees for a moment just because that's easier to understand. Let's say I have my min angle is negative 90. Again, this is in radians, in ROS, but right now we're going to just use degrees. And I pass in 10. So now I would have 10 minus negative 90, which would give me 10 plus 90, which would give me 100. Then I'm going to divide, so that's 100 total degrees, not 100 degrees, but um, 100 total degrees from the very beginning of my, of my range. Then we're going to divide that by the angle delta. And let's say for this example, we're going to pretend this is 0.5. I know this is not true self pseudocode. I'm just doing this to kind of show you. So if this is 0.5, that means 100 over 0.5, that would give me 200. Now, it may not be this nice. It might be some sort of like, you know, say 0 0.5, 1, 2, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, for this example, for this lecture example we're going to say 0.5 but it doesn't have to be a nice floating point number like this so it's going to be 200 and probably some change so we need to do a floor which will give us 200 this will means that 200 will be the index in our range, self.ranges, that represents the angle 10 degrees, given, uh, given this, this particular laser scanner that starts at negative 90 and has a 0.5 for a delta angle. And as long as we floor, we will not risk having a ray out of bounds. Now, again, this is just for, I'm using degrees here for your own sake. When I pass it in, this is, needs to be radians. This needs to be radians. So don't, don't forget that. But this is what's going on. So I pass in radians, subtract it from the minute angle, which is most likely negative then divide it by uh, the increment angle or delta angle and floor it and that will give me an index. Now I can go the other way as well and go and pass an index and I will get uh, the angle. In this case it's a little bit it's a little bit um, we're at, we are going to assume for a moment that, that this is a negative. Actually, no, we're not going to. This is mathematically correct. It is still radians, but using degrees, let's kind of use the opposite example. Let's say I sent in index 105. And let's say that we have the same laser scanner. It starts at negative 90. Again, I'm using degrees. It's easier to understand and we have a 0.5 angle increment. So the first thing we need to do is go with our index. We need to find out what is the total number of degrees or the total angle. Again, for examples, degrees, we're using radians. So that would be 105 is the total index. So that means 
there's been 105 readings, and for every reading we have an angle increment. So we're going to multiply that by angle increment, or delta angle in our case, which would be uh, 0.5. Okay, I lied. Let's make it 106. That way we don't need floating point issues here. Although it doesn't really matter. So that would give us 103, or sorry, excuse me, I apologize. That would give us 53 degrees. Now that's 50 degrees total, not 50 degrees from start. Or I should say, actually, it's 50, 53 degrees from start, not total, from the start. So if we need to, to find out what we're actually looking at, we need to take our 53 degrees and add it plus our minimum angle, which in this case was negative 90. And that would give me, I should put this in my head, but I'm having a little, uh, 37. Negative 37, excuse me. Negative 37. So the, the index at 106 is actually negative 37 degrees. Once again, with this laser scanner, once again, this needs to be radians, not degrees, but just for the sake of understanding what's ha the math, I'm using degrees. That makes sense because using the same laser scanner at, oh, I deleted it, but up here when I had 200, I was, or something like 210 or something, we were looking at 10 degrees. So this actually makes sense. Let me, let me, yeah, it was. I believe it was 210 if I remember right. 200 or something. Yeah, it was a much larger index. It was at 10 degrees, so a smaller index at 106. That was um, actually going to be in the negatives, in the negative 37 degrees. So that gives us the math for going from index to angle. Again, it needs to be radians, so it's going to be radians, not degrees. But these are the two helper functions. Now, going, uh, going back to our move, now we can understand what's happening here. So to figure out how fast I'm going forward, I'm gonna, I, am, I originally took the average value from the front arc, and you usually wanna do a front, you wanna do an arc, not necessarily not necessarily a single value because sometimes a single value might miss a wall barely and you think it's wide open and you run into it. So I'm using a negative 10 degree to 10 arc. Yes, I'm assuming that I've got a larger laser scan than negative 10 to 10, which we can make that assumption. Uh, when you I have seen laser scans as minimum as 45, so if you're making assumptions that your laser scan is greater than 45, you may want to you may want to check for that. But we can at the moment we can assume that we have a negative we can get a negative 10 to 10. Now again, it needs to be a, ra a radians, so I've got times math dot pi divided by 180, so that's 10 degrees over 180 degrees. The degrees cancel out and math.pi gives me radians. So that's that's what's happening here. Now I send those radians into angle to index and I get the index representing, the closest index representing negative 10 degrees and 10 degrees in radians. So this will give me an index from my range from to or start to finish. Then I'm gonna go through this in this for loop. So for, I is going to be a number and then I'm going to increment by one. Why am I incrementing by one and not angle increment? Because this itself is the index, not the, not the actual angle. These are 
indexes once I call this function. And all indexes, no matter what language, in arrays are going to be integers. So I'm going to increment by 1. Um, what I did instead of averaging them, I simply said if forward sum is greater than this current range, self.laserData, I also made forward sum really, really large. Then I'm going to say forward sum equals self.laserData. And actually, we wouldn't use scalars here yet, but I'm just, just mentioning that you might need scalars later on. So essentially here, I'm looking for the minimum, the minimum range in the front arc. I could average it, but in, for going forward, I wanted to find the bare minimum. I want to know how close I am in that front 20 degree arc. And you could play with these numbers a little bit too. Again, when you hit the expectation of having a f more than 45 degrees, you need to double check. So like this is assuming I have a 40 degree, that's fair. I have seen 45 degree range, ranges. So in this case, I'm just looking for the minimum. After this for loop, I will have found the minimum. I already know I have laser data because if laser data is not equal none, this, if it was equal to none, this would be false. I'm going to take the minimum in this case and divide it by the max range to give me a normalized value. <clears throat> then I'm going to, we'll come back to this, but this essentially is going to be what my forward velocity is. This is, a, in essence, a simple proportional controller. As I get closer to the wall, my range, my minimum range is going to be smaller, and thus my forward velocity is going to be smaller. If I needed, if I needed a, um, like say it was a, it, it was not using a normalized value for the controlling robot, this is where I might also need my scalar. Also, if I want, which I recommend doing, I should also multiply by, you know, compensate for the latency. What is the latency going to look like? It's going to essentially look like this. Um, it's going to be the max range. Sorry. It's going to be this line above, forward sum, divide equal, self.max range, times the actual time difference, sorry, 0.1 over the actual time difference. And again, on the hard, a hardware sensor, you could probably trust, well, actually, I take that back. If this will, you cannot necessarily trust the time difference on the laser scanner uh, because you might be getting late network latency. So you should actually do the time check here and record, you know, based on the last time you had, your current time minus the last time you had a time uh, to find out what the actual value here is. I would not trust the scanner message directly. So as the as the time between the scans increase, and you would have to do it up here, I guess. As the time of these scans increase, this is going to get smaller and smaller and smaller. And as it gets, I mean, you know, it's not going to be any greater than 0.1 because we have our whole system basically set at 10 hertz. Now this would be if your if your hardware sensor is going to pull something a little faster than 10 hertz, then you would have to change this number. But assuming it's pulling at 10 hertz, which is what the simulator is supposed to do, if this value is going to be larger than 0.1, then this is going to be a smaller than one value, which will decrease your which will further decrease your um, 
actually you wouldn't want to do it this way, but it would further decrease your forward sum. So you actually want to make it a separate line. Times equal. So after you divide by max range, then you do forward sum times equal and this proportion. The reason I'm making such a big deal about this is in the past, students have had the code working perfectly on their own computer. The minute it goes onto the network, the latency kicks in and the robot's going too fast to respond to a wall or obstacle and it runs into a wall. So this will compensate for that. All right. Now, that's half the battle. This is how fast we want the damn thing to run. Excuse me, sorry. This is how fast we want the robot to run. And notice it's always going forward. That is one flaw, and I don't want to say flaw, but that is one property of a vector-based steering is you always want the robot to go forward. Now, there's certain circumstances where you may have a state change that says you want the robot to go and turn in place, that's okay. But if you're only relying on vector steering, you always want the robot to try to go forward. Otherwise, what can happen is you get stuck in a local minimum or maximum, local minima, and you will end up spinning in place. So that this is one, this is one thing you always want to keep in mind. You always want the robot to try to go forward a little bit at least. Again, we're only steering the robot with vector steering, so we're not actually employing any sort of logic or state logic to the robot right now. So we have the robot going forward. That's great. <clears throat> the next step is let's make the robot uh, turn. Now for this, I'm going to use a somewhat naive approach. It's actually not bad. Um, I don't know if you'd want to have quite this. Excuse me, actually, that was right. I don't know if you'd want quite this arc. This is a pretty big arc, at least for our laser scanner, going from negative 10 degrees, or for going from min angle to negative 10, and going from 10 to max. That might be a little bit large, large of an arc, but it may not be. It depends on your laser scanner. So this, I'm using the re remnant of the laser scanner that I did not use for the forward vector to determine left and right. So again, if right is going to be to the right of zero degrees, which would be going negative, and left was going to be left of zero degrees or counterclockwise, which would be positive going around, a, around the unit circle. So uh, it may seem it may not seem intuitive to you. I always get them fl flipped, but right is negative, po left is positive. So here, right sum is gonna equal zero, count is zero. Here, I'm actually gonna average it. Same idea as what I did up here. I'm gonna get my range. This time, I'm gonna go from my minimum angle to my negative 10, but convert it to radians. Again, this will be indexes, indices, so I'm gonna increment it by one. Uh, and then I'm going to simply add the range to write sum and increment account. This time, after the for loop, I'm going to average it. Then I'm going to um, normalize it so it's 0 to 1. I'm going to do the same thing for the left sum. This time my ranges are going to go from 10 degrees, converted radians, to self.max angle. This is why I do need the max angle, the only time I use the max angle. And because I'm flooring this, I, I don't have to worry about accidentally overstepping the, the array. And then I'm going to add the you know left sum plus equals self.laser data. I'm going to reset count. Make sure we reset count here. Otherwise, it won't average right. I'm going to sum up the laser data values and then increment count. After the for loop, I'm going to average it, get the average length, and then I'm going to normalize that average. This is similar to the vector steering, except that in vector steering, you would take the entire laser scan, break it up into the forward and horizontal components, 
and add each scan together to get your final velocity and your final angular and forward. In this case, I'm separating it out. So when I compose my twist message, I message equals twist. We're almost done here. And message.linear.x, remember, is going to be going forward. And that's just going to be our forward sum, which in this case was our minimum forward laser scan normalized. It wasn't really a forward sum. The message angular z is going to be our rotation. And what I'm going to do here is I'm going to take the left sum, which is positive, and subtract it from the right sum, which is negative. Now, both of these values, no, I take it back. Both of these values are going to be positive. But you have to remember, if I want the robot to turn right, this value is going to be bigger, so it's going to, I want a, a negative angle. If I want the robot to turn left, this value needs to be bigger, so which would give me a positive value on my rotation. And then this is a scalar I put, again, this is a scalar for my local computer. You would also want, this is probably where you'd want to do your, uh, take into account your time difference. So you probably also want that here as well. Maybe, no, I take it out. You may not want that for rotation. Usually rotation, rotation is usually a little slower. You don't want the thing to spin really fast. That's one thing, but you can, you can compensate. If your latency kicks in, you're just gonna overshoot your rotation a little bit, so you might wiggle back and forth. Usually rotation is not quite as critical at compensating for as the forward is. But you might, you might want to put that in there. You need to test that out. Then once I have these, again, our robot can only go forward and backwards and left and turn in place or turn left and right. So these are the only two things I need to care about. And then we're going to do self.pub.publish message. And we are done. I know that was quite, quite the ordeal. But thank you for sticking with me. All right. Well, we're done with the code anyway. One thing, one other thing to do, two other things to do. Remember, we need to modify our setup.py. Make sure we add, I had simple drive, now I have laser drive. Um, again, it doesn't have to be the file name, but I just keep it the file name for consistency. I have also updated our XML we wrote, mover.xml. So instead of running our simple drive, I'm running laser drive instead of simple drive. Those are the two additional things we have to do. Again, let me go back to laser drive. So here, I'm gonna, if you need to pause the video, this is the first half, we'll say, first third. So pause the video right now if you need to. Okay. This is move right under, yeah, this is, this is basically move. The move definition is right above here. Let me see if I can, I can't really zoom out, but. Yeah, move is right. Move, so defining move is right above this. So pause it if you need to. And finally, our last chunk, our two helper functions and our main and if main, name is equal to main stuff down here. Again, pause it if you need to. All right, so we have that. Now you. We'll build it just to make sure I didn't mess anything up. Pretty sure I go to our workspace, call can build. All right. And we are going to actually need two terminals up. So we're going to go ahead and run our Unity simulator. And the first one we have our little we have our launch file I made for the simulator. So ROS2 Unity underscore sim. Sorry, excuse me. Launch Unity underscore sim. Unity underscore sim or Unity Sim XML. And again we want to wait, okay. 
And then, since I'm using it locally right now, I have it set on NAT, not bridge, so I don't have to change this. I'm gonna hit connect to ROS. And I wanna make sure it says one client connected, but I also wanna make sure it says this thing where it subscribes to Unity Spawn. That's the key. So the first thing I'm gonna do, I'm gonna make a new terminal. We're gonna do, in a moment, I get ROS, ROS2 topic list. We'll see, we have this new robot again. I also, you can also run the service if you want, but this is, in my opinion, a little bit easier. So we're gonna do ROS2 topic pub slash new underscore robot. And it's gonna be standard message string. So I can do STD and hit tab. Double quote, name, colon. This is the JSON. I'm literally typing out JSON right now. That. And then we need to make sure we have a double quote and make sure we have a negative one. So this is, again, pause if you need to. This is a little bit awkward. You may wanna make a bash script for this command. It's ROS2 topic pub new robots this is the topic you're publishing to this is the message type if you just put type std and hit tab it should finish it for you and this is the json for the string message you have the name colon space one space single quotes around bat and the negative one means we only want to send this once or minus one we only want to send this once No, I'm sorry, not name, excuse me. So data, data, data. And once it's, you know, it says publish, it only publishes it once. We have the, we have our robot is now spawned in. If I hit space, it's now armed, I can run it. So now all I need to do is do ROS2 launch class example and mover and we need to make sure we put our ns title remember our namespace title which uh, yeah, i call we do colon equal and then bat this is going to put bat in front of our our scan and our command velocity to make sure i'm reading the laser and sending commands to the correct robot i hit enter take a couple seconds to launch and here you can see off my robot goes now again this is how it would perform locally it might work on the network um, I think there's one or two places it might actually hit the wall because the late if latency kicked in the wrong point but you'll see here that it is working pretty well the last thing to mention before I close this video, and I don't think I'm gonna have you guys watch the whole thing, but if you watch this long enough, the robot will end up making this little circuit around, around the maze. And this is pretty typical for vector steering. It's vector steering all by itself. Like here, I am avoiding the walls. So I met my criteria having a safe wander, but as you see, as I start driving over here now, you'll see my robot here in a moment. There it is. You'll see that I start, I will find a cycle. So, and that's, that's okay as long as I have other behaviors that are competing to steer the robot. Right now, I'm only steering it with, with Safe Wander, so I would kind of expect a cycle to develop. But if, say, I had a green blob detection up, or I had, say, left wall follow, right wall follow up, and they were, we were arbitrating between these behaviors, then I would expect my robot to do other things. So here you see it's turning around, and you can probably guess right here is going to then go back to where it was up here and make this kind of figure eight pattern. So again, this is, a byproduct of only having one behavior and a simple vector steering behavior, I will get this cycle effect. But once there's other behaviors controlling or competing to control the robot, you will see deviation and you should see this um, behavior break, this cycle break, I mean. 
All right, thank you. I know this has been a long one. This one you probably want to watch multiple times because this one has a lot of meat in it. And part of the lab for this class will be setting up a left wall follow, a right wall follow, and eventually a green uh, green blob tracker. So we we will be coming back to this kind of this particular form of script a lot. So there's a lot of stuff here to think about. All right, thank you for watching. Until next time.